Well, uh, last Sunday uh, was, was a wonderful day in church. And uh, after, after church was over, Pamela and I uh, drove to New York to visit with my mom, my 94 and a half year old mother in Rye, New York. And um, we were there until late Thursday night. Uh, nowadays, a three and a half hour drive takes five hours or so. I don't know why that is other than there's a million people on the road. But um, anyway, when I go away like that, I try to have someone speak on the Sunday that, that I get back because it's hard to put it all together in a short period of time. So I had arranged for Pastor Bill Unger to share the word. If you don't know our dear brother, uh, Pastor Bill, uh, Bill and Edna have been here for many years now. I don't know, I, I think all together, maybe about 12 years, but four of those years were in North Carolina, but then they came back again. And uh, they have served in many different capacities. Uh, pastor Bill was our associate pastor um, he's on our board right now. He has served, has served as our treasurer. Uh, Bill and Edna were missionaries for a while over in Italy and Spain as well. And uh, Pastor Bill served in the military. He comes with a wealth of experience, life experience and uh, pastoral experience. Uh, he's an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God. And uh, I heard the message this morning. This is a great word. So uh, give our brother, Pastor Bill, a warm welcome as he comes today. And uh, may I say, the family is here as well, uh, visiting from California and New Hampshire, and God bless you all. I did it for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Uh, in the uh, first service, Pastor Rick was uh, talking about his mother, and uh, I didn't realize that his mother's name was Margaret, and uh, that's my mother's name. And uh, a lot of things that uh, parallel Rick's life with mine, we're both born in the same year. He's uh, two months older than I am, so I consider him to be my older brother. And uh, so really have appreciated his, he's been like a brother to me, he really has in many ways. But um, when I was uh, writing this sermon, you know, I just basically do an outline. I just, there was something about it that I didn't really like. And uh, uh, when I finished re writing it and I read it over and I realized what my problem was, it was probably the worst sermon I've ever written. And uh, so I started doing some, rev some revision yesterday and uh, hopefully I got it right. Uh, what I want to talk about today is... Um, what is, what is the nature of the Christian church? What is the church supposed to look like? Uh, we, we see a lot of different uh, images of churches today. We, we see churches that have thousands of people that go to them, and then we have smaller churches like our own here. Um, is, is there a right way? Is there a wrong way to do church? Uh, I, I'm sure that there is. There's all kinds of books written about church growth and churches in general. Uh, but I want to just talk about what is the basic. I don't care how big or little your church is. Uh, Jesus said, if two or three are gathered in my name, there I'll be in their midst. And so uh, in the church of God, that constitutes the church. That's a doctrinal statement. Uh, uh, that if you want to start a church in the church of God, you only need two or three people to start with. So I want to get to the core of what it means to be a church. Now, Jesus as he is approaching closer and closer to uh, the time when he would be crucified, uh, he began to ask some questions of his uh, disciples. And he's saying, what, you know, what do people, what, what do they say about me? Who do they think I am? And they start throwing out a bunch of names. You're John the Baptist, you're Elijah, you're this, you're that. 
And he says, well, who do you think I am? And so that brings us to Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 16 through 18. And so Simon Peter answered, and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time that we come now to just look into your word. I pray for your anointing uh, upon myself as I just endeavor, Lord, to communicate what you've placed in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church, what he's talking about is the proclamation that Peter makes that upon this statement, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That is the basis of what the church is. Christ, um, Jesus Christ is first and foremost, the focal point of the church's existence, his birth, his life, his crucifixion and his resurrection. All of these things are central to our beliefs as a church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul is reminding the Corinthian people. He had been there before, and it had been several years since he'd been there, and he's writing back to them to address certain problems. But before he came to Corinth, he was, if you read in the book of Acts, he had been in Athens, uh, sort of having fellowship with the local philosophers, and they kind of thought he was a little bit off his rocker. And Luke says that, you know, they really didn't, not much really happened there. You know, they had a few converts, but there was not a lot of success. And so Paul reminds them that uh, in chapter two, and he says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing let nothing else among you except Jesus Christ and, his, and him crucified. And so all the philosophies that Paul, or philosophers that Paul had to uh, talk to and all the exchanging that took place in Athens, he said all of that was nothing to him. That those philosophies didn't do anything for anybody as far as changing people's lives on a fundamental level. Now, in colleges, you could probably get a, uh, in some colleges, you can get a uh, degree in philosophy. And when you graduate, good luck finding a job. <laughs> you may get a job, you know, at Burger King or someplace like that. Um, you know, and, and there's no disgrace in that, but, uh, you know, maybe that's not what your goal was to begin with. But let's look at what Paul is saying here. He says that Jesus is the message, uh, is our message, because no one else has the capacity to change our lives on the very fundamental level. Paul says, uh, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, everything becomes new. You're a new person. All the stuff that happened in the past, as far as God is concerned, that's done with. I don't care what, you, what your lifestyle was, what you did. Uh, as far as God is concerned, uh, in Psalms it says, as far as the east is from the west, so have I forgiven your sins and remember them no more. And he's, he just wipes it out. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. It doesn't count. Uh, and that's good news. Everything that Jesus taught us was motivated by God's love for his people. Now, I've, I've known uh, preachers, Pastors, uh, some of them are in that position because they kind of crave the attention. Paul was uh, telling the Philippians, he says, there are those that preach with different motives. Some thinking that they're gonna add to my own misery. He says, but I don't really care so long as the gospel is being preached. That's the important thing because when you encounter the love of God, then you are encountering something that is outside of yourself that has the capacity to make the changes in your life that you can't make on your own. 
Now, some people might say, well, you know, my life's not too bad. I don't need Jesus. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Jesus is, uh, you know, you talk about all these drunks and drug addicts and people with all different problems. You know, they come to Christ because they, you know, they're desperate. They need something. I don't, you know, I don't do those things. You know, so why do I need Jesus in my life? You know, but it said that within every person there is this emptiness. There is this something that is missing. And some refer to it as a kind of a God-sized hole in our lives. Uh, that only God can fulfill. And so when Jesus was teaching people, you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, all of these things that Jesus taught us exposes us to what God wants to do in your life. Maybe you didn't have a bad life before you came to Christ, but, you know, as life goes on, things happen. And things happen that maybe you didn't expect were, were going to happen. I know when, uh, when we moved to North Carolina, where I remember when we first got there, I thought, you know, of all the places I thought that I would live, I never thought I would live in North Carolina. And a few years later, I thought, of all the places I would ever live, I never thought I would be living in New Hampshire. <laughs> it seems like every place I've gone, I never dreamed that I would ever be there, you know? And, and I guess that's kind of exciting. Uh, it's, it's a little bit nerve-wracking sometimes. Uh, but I know that the Bible says that the steps of a righteous person are ordered by God. Now, I'm not claiming righteousness for myself, but I know that, uh, that God has directed our lives, God has led our lives to places where maybe we didn't think that that would be where we were going to end up. I remember in, in our first assignment on the mission field was in Spain and we were ministering to people in the military there and we had one couple that was going to be stationed in Sigonella, Italy, which is in uh, Sicily. And I was listening to my friend talk about, you know, being stationed in Italy and I thought to myself, man, that is the one place I would not want to be. And a few years later, that's where we end up. But you know, when I was in Spain, I remember back when I took a mission trip to Puerto Rico when I was in college, and after coming back from Puerto Rico, I thought, man, I could never work in a Hispanic society. You know, that, that just was not my orientation. And, and we end up in places that I thought I would never be, Things, places that I thought were, I, I wouldn't want to be there. And after going there, then I realized, hey, this, is, this is not so bad. You know, because when you're in the will of God, when you're in the place where God wants you to be, there's that peace knowing that, hey, I am where he wants me to be. You know, this is, this is what he has called me to do. And there is this peace, and there is this joy in doing what it is that you're doing because you know that uh, it's pleasing to God. Consequently, God gives us the capacity to fulfill his command to love everybody. Uh, and this oftentimes is where we fall down. This is where we fail. This is where we drop the ball a lot of times. You expect me to love that person, that backstabbing gossip who's been in the church forever? Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually he does. You see, the, the call of loving one another, it's in uh, John chapter 13 verse 34 and 35, and he says, I, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. In biblical thinking, love is not an option. It is a must. It is something that we're commanded to, but I don't feel that emotion. I don't you know, especially when I'm dealing with certain people who I know um, uh, there are things about them that are not, that are not right. Uh, well, you know something? There's probably some things in your life that are not right either. You know, God looks at us as all, we're all the same. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are. Uh, God loves all of us. Jesus is not just some religious figure uh, that... Uh, you know, that, that we have tons of in, uh, throughout our history. But he is the only religious figure that when he comes into your life makes a difference in your life that is lasting. 
and gives us that capacity to love one another in especially towards those that um, may have left you scarred, uh, may have left you disappointed, may have left you hurt. Uh, anybody who's been in the ministry full time for any length of time knows what I'm talking about, that you encounter people that um, for one reason or another have decided that they're going to hurt you or maybe you don't live up to their expectation or maybe you're not you didn't make that decision that they wanted you to make and so consequently there are there are hurts there are disappointments uh, just because you're a Christian just because you go to a Christian church doesn't mean that you're immune to being hurt but there are something that we have to remember when Jesus was being crucified he was being crucified unlawfully uh, I, I think I read one statistic where it said a sacrifice, sacrificing an animal, uh, the Bible tells us that, that that didn't really make it. I mean, that was a substitute for the real thing. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 through 15, it says, How much more then uh, will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleansed our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free, from the sins committed under the first covenant. The first thing that I want to point out here is that Jesus clears our conscience. All the things that you've done in the past, all the things that have hurt you, all the things that you know are wrong, and perhaps you have been made to feel guilty over these things, or maybe you've been making yourself feel guilty, all of that is gone now. He has wiped the slate clean. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he forgiven your sins and remembers them no more. God doesn't remember it. God doesn't regard it any longer, so why should I? And I think what we have here is the beginning, is the beginning of learning how to love yourself. I think a lot of people, I don't know how many, I don't know what the statistics are, but I, I have read in some places that uh, many people turn to atheism simply because they got tired of feeling guilty. You know, God didn't answer my prayer, so therefore there must not be a God. But yet I still feel this sense of guilt on me, so uh, I, I have to do something to get rid of this guilt. So oftentimes people will turn to atheism as a means of alleviating that sense of guilt. Now, that's not really a rational argument. That's an emotional argument. But that's the way, that's the level that many people work on. We make decisions based on uh, some emotional response, or we establish our belief not necessarily on a rational argument or evidence, but on the way we feel. And that's not really a good basis uh, to establish belief. Christ is our mediator. He stands between us and God. He stands between those who are guilty and have no defense and God who is our judge. Now, some people kind of get the impression um, from some churches that that's all God's interested in, is passing judgment, is uh, constantly watching, waiting for you to mess up. Uh, and actually, the very opposite is the true. God knows you're going to mess up. He doesn't have to wait for you to do it. God doesn't put you in situations to see how you're going to behave. He already knows how you're going to react. He already knows how you're going to behave. That's not on the level that God is operating on. God is operating on the level of love, and he wants us to experience that love, to come into uh, the reality of what it means to be encompassed by his spirit so that his presence and his love becomes real in your life. Amen. So he's not 
it's not his intention that he judges because we are sinners. He wants to eliminate that necessity. And so Jesus Christ provides the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice to, uh, to eliminate all of those sins. Christ as the mediator offers himself up as a ransom to set us free. Now that doesn't mean that we're suddenly we're perfect. In 1 John it says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Following the command of Jesus to love one another, the disciples, therefore, they organize a church that is built on the premise that we are to love one another because that is the initial evidence that people see that we are different, that Jesus is at the center of our fellowship. Now, again, I don't, it doesn't matter how big or how small the church is. If Jesus is not in the center that is creating change in people's lives, then something is missing. And so these disciples, they created this fellowship. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 43, he says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And every, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. I think many people give up on, on Christianity simply because their level of Christianity was very shallow to begin with. Because the churches don't always teach the gospel. They don't always teach the word of God to any depth. We know what we believe, but we don't always know why we believe it. Why does, why, do, why does the Bible say the things that it does? You know, am I missing something here? Maybe I have to dig a little bit deeper. I have to, what, what is behind what's going on here? What is, what is going on in the mind of God that I, that I may be missing here? And when we, uh, when we seek diligently, uh, that, knowing that God reveals himself to those who seek after him diligently, then he reveals himself to us by changing the way that we think. We no longer think humanistically. We don't normally think the way that we used to think, but now we think biblically. Now, when I say we think biblically, what I mean is we think the way God intended us to understand the things of God. Now, I don't understand everything about God. I don't understand everything about the Bible. There are things in the Bible that, uh, that I, uh, I, I still have a problem with, okay? Uh, Jesus, I mean, God tells the people of Israel to go into the promised land and kill everybody, essentially ethnic cleansing. How do you reconcile that with what Jesus says to love your enemies? Okay, you just think about that, <laughs> okay? Uh, give me a call when you get the answer. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. When I, uh, you know, the, uh, there was just something, there were just some things that, you know, I wish I had more notes here, but uh, in our class on Wednesdays, uh, you know, I, I, I believe we get into some real depth that uh, maybe, you, maybe people don't normally think about. Uh, like, for example, uh, Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? What is, do you really know what that means? There are some people that take that passage and they pervert it. They distort it in ways that uh, are not what God really wants us to understand. We look at the present situation today and we see that you have teachers that are saying that if you're, if, if you're sick and you're poor, you're probably demon-possessed. 
if you're not if you're not a millionaire, if you're not making tons of money, then you're not doing something right. God's not blessing you. You sound like Job's comforters more than uh, disciples of Christ. And I see political and religious leaders using religious slogans to gather people's interest and support when in reality they're not really supporting the, the work of God but they're supporting the work of an individual. And it's perverted, it's distorted, and it's of the devil. It's not of God. Now, there have been charlatans throughout the church's history. And there will always be charlatans uh, way until Jesus comes back. The charlatans are not uh, really what I too, am too concerned about. I remember a passage uh, from the first Star Wars movie uh, where Obi-Wan is telling Han Solo, who's the bigger fool? The fool or the fool that follows the fool? So that's what I worry about is the effect that these things have on people. Now, I don't know why these things take root and prosper but I know that if we think deeply about the things of God and allow him to change the way that we think, when we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and not just make us good people, but make us smart people, discerning people. You know, we say in the Assemblies of God that the baptism of the Holy, or in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the initial evidence is tongues. Okay, well, what? How about discernment of spirits? Uh, you don't hear so much about that. But yet, I think we need that more than we need tongues. That's just my personal opinion. You can, you can take it or leave it. The next thing that these disciples or these people in this early church did was they broke bread together. They had fellowship. They got together and they got together often. The idea of breaking bread, eating together, uh, there's something about that that has a, has a way of binding us, of bringing us closer together, creating a fellowship. I remember when, uh, when Edna and I first went to Barrie in, in Massachusetts, one of the first things I wanted to do was something that I've always done everywhere we've gone, and that is simply have a potluck dinner. I had absolutely no idea what a potluck dinner was. You know, who's supposed to bring what? Uh, who's who's going to bring the... What, for what, what kind of food are we supposed to bring? What kind of, you know, who's going to supply the drinks? Who's going to supply, the, you know, had all kinds of questions. Because they never had done that before. And I said, you bring whatever you want to bring. If everybody brings, you know, macaroni salad, then that's what we'll have. Okay, or if everybody brings potato salad, we'll have potato salad dinner. Just bring whatever you want to bring. And so that became a tradition in the church. And I was... Uh, reading on the church's website, uh, June 27th, potluck dinner. You know, I'm glad I had some effect someplace, you know. <laughs> you know, if it isn't anything, it's getting people at least to eat together, have fellowship. Next thing is that they did is they prayed. They got together for prayer. Um, now, what does prayer do? Now, that may seem like a silly question. But I think oftentimes we underestimate what prayer does. Now, back around 1990, around in the fall, uh, when we were in Italy, uh, I believe that the Spirit, Holy Spirit was speaking to me about tearing down walls. And when we talk about tearing down walls, I think about walls that people put up around themselves. You know, how people isolate themselves. I remember a song from the 1960s sung by Simon and Garfunkel. It's called The Sound of Silence. People talking without speaking, people hearing without listening because of the walls that we use to separate us. So I thought that's what, that's what we were doing. So it was impressed upon me to um, do something that, I, that I'd never do. Uh, you know, I mean, it has to be God. I never would have done it otherwise. And that is we would have a march around the base, a small base, and we would march around the perimeter of the base. On each corner of the base, we would stop and pray. And to do that for seven weeks on 
Thursday afternoon after everybody got off from work. And so we did that. Uh, on the seventh week, uh, you know, we finished, uh, we closed in prayer and everybody went home. When and then I got home, I turned on the TV set and uh, tuned into CNN, and what I saw was people dancing on the Berlin Wall. And other people were taking jackhammers and sledgehammers and tearing it down. Now, are we responsible for that? I'm not going to say yes to that. I'm not going to say no, but we participated in it. You see, uh, I think it was Dwight L. Moody who said that the world is yet to see what can happen with one person dedicated to prayer can do. Jesus told his followers, he said that if you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Now, I believe Jesus is using hyperbole to make a point. And that is that the power of prayer is greater than anything that you could think or imagine. And that it is not to be taken lightly. It is not to be ignored. And it's not to be utilized just when the chips are down and you don't know where to turn. But prayer is something that should be part of who you are as an individual and part of who we are as a church. And so there must be time when the church comes together for the purpose of just prayer. Not with any particular agenda, not with any particular message necessarily, but just get together and pray. The next thing that uh, Luke talks about is that they gave of their resources. Now, I'm not talking about your 10% tithes. The people in the early church in Jerusalem, they gave everything that they had available to give. And the point here is not how much you give or what you give, but giving with, you know, as, as Paul said, giving uh, joyfully not grudgingly. The Bible does, uh, the New Testament doesn't even use the word tithe. But these people gave everything that they had that they could give. And so that everybody would have an equal share. Those who didn't have anything, those who were poor, they didn't have to worry about not getting food. They didn't have to worry about where their next meal was coming from because the church would provide it for them. And so giving of your resources, now again, people have distorted that and have turned it into, have taken the American ideal of you do something for me and I'll do something for you. If you do something for God, God will do something for you. And that's, that's a perversion. That's a, it's a false teaching and it's cultic. If you give anything, do it because it gives you pleasure to do it. And by not doing it, you rob yourself of a blessing. Now, I'm, going to be the, I'm not even going to tell you that. If you put $10 in the offering, God's going to give you 100 Now, some people may teach that. Some people may believe that. But if I put $10 in the offering, believe me, I don't care. Because I don't have to worry about my needs. Because the Bible says that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, I remember after Edna and I got, got married, shortly after we were married, we were in church, and we had kind of an unusual pastor that we were going to. He said, you know, he passed the plate around. He said, put money in it. If you need money, take some out. <laughs> uh, I've only seen that one time. <laughs> so I had $10 in my wallet. That was my last $10, um, you know, until payday, which was on Thursday. And so, you know, I'm going to need, you know, that's all I got till Thursday, you know, I got to, you know, need my Dunkin' Donuts, you know, and so I put the $10 in out of obedience to the Holy Spirit, and God didn't give me $100, didn't give me anything, but turns out I didn't need it. You know, I didn't, there was nothing that I needed to spend money on for those few days, and then when Thursday came, I got my paycheck, and, you know, it just went on. You see, Here's the thing. When the Bible says that God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory, 
That means he's going he's to take care of you. Now, he may wait till after the last minute to do it, but he will come through for you. And those experiences are faith building. And what that does is it creates within me a sense of confidence, knowing that, as Jesus said, I'm always going to be with you. He's always going to go through whatever you have to go through. If you're faithful to him, he will be faithful to you. Another aspect of the church was their commitment and loyalty to each other. Uh, in a culture that values convenience such as ours, cult uh, uh, commitment and loyalty can sometimes be very conditional. You know, I'll do something for you if you do something for me. Uh, if it's convenient to go to church, uh, that's okay. I, I remember a friend of mine who was pastor of a church. He says, I'm not going to go to church today because it's too hot. I'm not going to go to church today because it's raining. I'm not going to go to church today because it's snowing. Uh, I'm not going to go to church. I'm too tired. Um, it's just, it's not a matter of what you do on a level of duty. I mean, and duty is important. But what do you want to do? What's important to you? What do you really need in your life? Now, I do not want to make anything that has to do with church and Christianity reduce it to some legalistic function. We do it because it gives us pleasure to do it. Not because I feel obligated or because if I don't, I'm going to get a phone call from the pastor that afternoon. <laughs> you know, where you been? Now, he may do that, and that's fine. Uh, he may, you know, who knows, you may be... Uh, you know, maybe sick and can't even dial the phone. <laughs> you know, so I, I appreciate guys like Pastor Rick, you know, checking up on me. <laughs> this kind of conditional thinking uh, is not what I would call biblical thinking. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9 through 11, he says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor. Uh, one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keeping your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. So first of all, let's look at love. Love is a willingness to be committed in a relationship that benefits the other person. Whether it be, as I say, whether it be the individual or whether it be the church body as a whole. I am not here in this church to be fed necessarily. I mean, I don't have to worry about being fed because it's going to happen anyway. But I believe that God wants me here as a resource or as a means by which other people can be blessed. People who go around church to church saying, well, I'm looking for some place to be fed. You want to be fed? Go feed somebody. Go be a blessing to someone else. Now, some churches may be having problems. Some churches may be going through difficulties. Well, that may be the church I want to go to. Because that, I know that's where I could be of best use. Now, I'm not saying that this church was in bad shape before I came. It wasn't. <laughs> but I'm saying that has been my thinking in the past. That I do not measure a church by how good it is. I remember when we were, when we were on the mission field, we supported the chapel program on base. And let me tell you, we had a couple of chaplains there that they were not good. Okay, they hated each other. Uh, one of the chaplains, when he uh, transferred out, usually you get some kind of a, a badge, a ribbon, you know, a medal, saying that you, that you served overseas. And the base commander wouldn't even give him that. that they, we, don't even want, we don't want people to know that you are here. That's how bad these guys were. Now, you know, if you're getting that from your boss, from your base commander, you know, you haven't done your job. But yet, we went to that chapel, and most of the people that functioned in the Sunday school program came from our servicemen center, because we emphasized supporting that program. Now, eventually, we got some chaplains that were good, and we had great fellowship together. But we were a benefit to those people, not because it was a good place, but because it was a place that needed us. 
we have to be willing to make commitments even when those are difficult to make or you're under very adverse circumstances. What is devotion? A definition for devotion is love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause, and in this case, uh, to each other and to the church and to the church's mission, to preach the gospel. Now, when I talk about preaching the gospel, I'm not, I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm talking about the living the gospel in our lives to people that need to see what it means to be a Christian. Not to be a member of a denomination or a group, but to be a child of God in a way that I allow God to live his life through mine. Spiritual fervor, being passionate about serving the Lord. Now, I know that there are times when the last thing you feel is passionate about anything. <laughs> you know, you're tired. You know, maybe you're fed up. Maybe things aren't going the way you want them to go. That's the time to maybe just stop what you're doing and let God minister to you somehow, someplace, some way. Uh, God told David, he says, be still and know that I am God. And there are times when uh, I've known people, friends of mine, that, that had to go through something in their lives. And, and I remember one particular friend of mine in, uh, went to Nyack College, and I was in the Air Force, and uh, I, was, I took leave, and you know, we got together up at Nyack. And he was going through a problem. A lot of it had to do with a relationship with another girl that, wasn't, that didn't go well. Uh, you know, it's always something like that. And uh, so he took me up uh, to this place. What it was was a cemetery. Uh, and it was an old cemetery, you know, like going back to the 1700s. You know, and, and he said that, you know, if you take, some of these were laying on the ground flat and you really couldn't read anything. But if you take dirt, and you spread it over it, you know, the dirt fills in the gaps and you can read what was written on there. So we did that, and I thought that was really interesting, but then it got dark, and there was this fog, sort of like a mist that started to form around the uh, cemetery, and there was this big oak tree on the corner, and suddenly we just kind of felt the presence of the Holy Spirit there, and there was just, there was this calm, you know, you, you never think about having an encounter with God in, the, in an old cemetery, you know. But God will meet you even when everything around you is dead. The question is just to take the time to do it. So uh, I'm going to close. I think maybe I've gone a little over time. Um, as I told the... Uh, uh, people in the first service. Usually when I'm writing a, a message out, I'll, in the bottom I'll, I'll write in the word closing and I'll have some, you know, classy statement to make, you know, that kind of pulls it all together. I got nothing. You know, I, I couldn't think of anything, you know, you know. You know, I had to rewrite the whole thing to begin with. You know, I was tired of it. I was, but let me, let me just say only that uh, I am here not because I felt duty bound, you know, I was here before, I was associate pastor and this, that, and everything else. I'm here because I want to be here. Uh, and I like it here. Uh, I enjoy coming to church. Uh, so I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Rick if you'll come and, uh, you know, kind of close us out and, uh, and, you know, just whatever you do, you know. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time that we've had. Lord, I pray that your spirit would just touch each person here today. I pray that you would bring conviction where it is needed. I pray that you would give peace and comfort where that is needed. And I pray, Lord, that we would all experience your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's let Pastor Bill know we appreciate his word today. Can we stand together?
I want to just reiterate uh, Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew 16. <clears throat> G, uh, Peter answered Jesus and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the, of the living God. And I want to just think about that for a second because knowing who Jesus is is really important, but surrendering to him is even more important. So there may be some here that know who Jesus is, but that's as far as it's gone. So with every head bowed for just a moment, is there anyone here today that knows that Jesus Christ is Lord, but you have not yet surrendered to that Lord? You have not yet given him your heart, and you want to do that today. Just raise your hand if that's you. I want to give my heart to the Lord today. And Jesus responded to Peter, and he said, you're blessed because this, this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father revealed this to you. I wonder if there's anybody here that feels like I need a revelation from God. I need God to reveal something to me about my relationship with God or about my life. Anyone need a fresh revelation? My hand is up for that one. And then Jesus said, Peter, I will build my church upon this statement or this rock that you've said that I am the Christ. I wonder if there's some here that, that feel like I have something to give to the Lord. I have something to do in the kingdom of God. I just want to find my outlet. I want to find my purpose uh, in, in my service to the Lord. Anyone like that? Yeah. Okay. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for a, a wonderful time of worship and prayer, a good time in your word today, Lord. I pray that everyone that heard the word would just, just take it to heart and, and to remember the value of Christian love and what you've called us to do to get into the doctrine of the church, the fellowship and the prayers of, with one another. Lord, help us to be the best that we could be. Because, Lord, underneath it all, there's a dying community all around us. And the community needs to see and hear what Christians have to offer. So, Lord, I thank you for this day. Uh, I do pray your blessing upon everyone here. Uh, thank you for those that came out. Thank you for those that joined us on live stream. May your blessing, Lord, be upon them as well. And, uh, Lord, let us have a good afternoon. And let us get back together tonight for our, our hour of prayer. So we give you all thanks. We give you all praise. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. Well, God bless you. We love you. We'll be on live stream tonight at 6 on uh, Facebook, New Life Haverhill. Hope to see you then. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Bill. You are here. Move.